to speak with you tonight about testosterone. And so uh, it's very prevalent to have low testosterone. It can affect multiple organ systems, and we'll talk about this. Uh, we'll talk about symptoms, how we diagnose it, how we treat it. So as a urologist, the number one complaint I see in gentlemen with low testosterone is issues with erectile function and libido. So simply state, if you have a low testosterone, fixing that will improve directions. Okay, and it's pretty easy how it works. It dilates the arteries uh, in your pelvis in and around your penis. It works well enough where I see gentlemen who have failed Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, and somebody looks into their testosterone, it's low, we raise that up, and then on that uh, medication, they can have an adequate erection. So this is a big myth of testosterone. I hear this driving around in my car, listening to radio ads and seeing ads on TV, that this is a miracle drug and it'll fix any problem with your erections. It's not true. If you have organic erectile dysfunction, which means you have damage to those, those vessels that Dr. Griebar just showed because of atherosclerosis, because of hypertension, because of diabetes, fixing your testosterone is not going to solve the problem. So if you have a problem because of a low testosterone, uh, this can help you. But if, if you've got a narrowed, a narrowed lumen because of disease, this is not going to overcome that problem. So libido, it parallels uh, testosterone levels. So it's been shown, gentlemen with low to low normal testosterone, if we replace that, your interest in sexual motivation is going gonna, is gonna to come up to an appropriate level. In terms of muscle system, so anabolic effects, it builds lean muscle mass. It's pretty simple. It, 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 it uh, encourages protein synthesis. It blocks protein degradation. In terms of fatty muscle mass or fatty um, body composition, it does the reverse. It, 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 it blocks um, fat uptake in terms of synthesis. In terms of blood levels, we see patients that have anemia, low blood level uh, because of lower testosterone. And you can't, with testosterone treatment, you can see gains in that. Um, it's more prevalent with uh, injections. We do, have, we do have cream therapy, and I'll talk about that. But you see these um, gains more with injection therapy. Now, people use this um, in kind of not so ethical ways. So if there are any cyclists in the room or people that follow that, Floyd Landis, who won the tour a couple years ago, he was stripped of his yellow jacket because this is how he won. He was, uh, they were injecting testosterone and doping, and it was raising his blood level, uh, which allowed him to bind more oxygen and, and work harder when he's riding his bike. In terms of bone, um, I have a couple patients that I, I treat with testosterone, not because they have problems with their erections, but because they have osteoporosis. And so it works through multiple pathways that are kind of beyond the scope of this talk, but it encourages bone deposition and blocks bone reabsorption. In terms of mood and cognitive effects, it's going to improve mood if you have a problem with depressed mood. Now, if you're clinically depressed, Studies that have shown probably treating just with testosterone isn't enough to lift you from that depression. You're going to need more traditional means. Um, but it, it is going to also improve cognition in terms of memory, visual, spatial, verbal fluency. So this is where this, this talk used to be an easy talk in terms of the slide. Um, and now it's a little bit more complicated. And we know from prostate cancer literature that having a low endogenous testosterone, so having a low level, is going to cause problems with your lipids, with your LDL, with your HDL, which puts you at a higher risk for, for, for heart attack. And there have been a number of studies that have shown this, and a number of studies that have shown that improving that is going to decrease this risk. Now, the problem is, is that this is where it gets a little bit complicated. Within the last quarter or so, there have been two studies that have shown kind of that our assumptions were wrong, that if we do replace testosterone, there might be an increased risk of heart attack. Okay, so these are the two studies. The first one is PLOS1. The second one was done by a endo, um, an endology group um, in JAMA. And both of them show the same thing. The JAMA study is a better study. They're both retrospective. But what they both show is that in older patients and in patients with significant cardiovascular risk factors in, in history, there is a slightly increased risk of heart attack on study. Now, the problem with the study is that 
they looked at two groups of men. So it was a study where they looked at a couple thousand men that had had coronary casts through the VA, and then they looked going forward, group that wasn't on testosterone, a group that was on testosterone, and they compared what happened. The issue with the study was that 25% of the men in the treatment group only got one dose of testosterone. Okay, so they're, then they're making inferences about their heart attack risk at one, two, three years in gentlemen who only got one dose of testosterone, that the half-life is, is approximately two weeks. So the point is that this risk might be real, but we need better studies. Luckily, um, there's, a, there's a randomized control trial, which if you talk to people about studies, is the study that's the best type of study. And that's accruing now, and that's hopefully going to answer a lot of these questions. But this is now when I see patients that have a risk um, factor of coronary disease or that are older, we, we need to talk about this and, and see if, if treatment um, is going to be beneficial when you balance it versus their risk of this potentially. In terms of prostate cancer, um, there's no evidence that, that treating with testosterone is going to cause prostate cancer or cause an indolent uh, cancer to, to, to take off. With that said, if, if, if I start patients on treatment, we do rule out any active disease. We do that with a rectal exam and with a, with a blood test. I'm going to skip that one. So that's kind of how it affects organ systems, but patients don't present to us with talking about organ systems. They present with, with symptoms. So what are the symptoms? Diminished energy, depressed mood, decreased libido, problems with erections, um, changes in body composition, problems with strength. I didn't really talk about it, but they can have problems with, with sugar metabolism, with diabetes, if, if the testosterone is low as well. So again, this is a common thing. Starting at age 30, you start to have decreased production. And by the age of 40, 40% 40 of men, by definition, have a, a deficiency in testosterone. Now, that doesn't mean that I want Dr. Myers to go out and find all these guys and screen and treat them, because if they're not symptomatic, we shouldn't be treating them because of the risks, whether, whether how, how significant they are or not. Only 6% of those gentlemen are actually going to be symptomatic. And those are the guys we want to find and, and potentially treat. So what are the goals of treatment? Basically re reversing those symptoms. So improving libido, improving erectile function, increasing body composition. When can't we treat you? If you've got active prostate or breast cancer, men can have breast cancer, it's pretty rare. If your red blood cell count is, is too high, those are absolute risks. Those are no-goes. I can't treat you. Relative risk. If you have a strong family history of cardiovascular disease or you have a personal history, we need to talk about those studies. If you have difficulty with sleep apnea, a lot of the theories in these cardiovascular studies is that it, it, the risk is caused by a worsening of sleep apnea. So that has to be worked out. If you have a history of CHF. So, this is the workup. This is what I think of when I'm, when I'm trying to work patients up. And this is pretty simple, but it needs to be done correctly or it's, or it's invalid. So we start um, up here. Patients see their doctors and they're complaining of symptoms. And it's our job to say, well, maybe this is low testosterone. So we measure a, a lab test. And this is the key step. It needs to be done in the morning. There are the, the testosterone goes up and down during the day. And it needs to be done in the morning or it's not valid. If it's above 300, that's normal. Even if it's 301, that's normal. And you've got to look at other causes. And that's the problem with the symptoms is that they're pretty nonspecific, which means that those can be because of low testosterone. They can also be because you don't sleep well, you don't eat well, you don't exercise, you've got other medical problems, you've got anxiety or stress at work or home. So we need to look for those other causes. If it's less than 300, then we're going to repeat the test because we know 30% of this these tests are spuriously low and, and not, not correct. So we're going to repeat. And again, if it's over 300 on that second, we've got to look for other reasons. If it's low, then we've got our diagnosis and we can talk about treatment. Now, there's a few extra steps in here in terms of we look for the cause. So the, the way testosterone production works is there's an area in your brain that makes a signal, that sends a signal to a second area of your brain, which then sends a signal to your testicles. And we have a way through a simple lab test of figuring out, is it, a, is it an error with, with brain messaging, or is it an area of difficulty with the, te with the testicle actually producing the testosterone? So we'll look for that when we talk about treatment. So 
if we are going to treat, we have to look at a few things. We, we establish there's no active prostate cancer. We look at blood levels. We look at testosterone. And then we look at response to therapy once we get going, and we monitor these things on an annual basis. So how do, if, if people want to have this replaced, how, how do we replace it? Um, I'm going to go through some of these. Oral preparations aren't FDA approved. So if you hear TV ads um, for pills, don't get those because they're not going to work and they're not great for your liver. We can do injections, patches, gels. Buckled discs are FDA approved. I don't have any patients on these currently. Um, they cause a lot of irritation and, and patients don't like them, so we don't use those a lot. Then we can do a procedure in the office with, uh, with subcutaneous pellets as well placed under the skin. So injections, um, these are the two different preparations. We mainly use the first. They work well, okay, the medicine is cheap. Um, the problem is it's not physiologic. So I think I got this from a physics textbook. This isn't actually um, what occurs in your body, but it's close. What, what we want is, is a nice normal level, and that's what your body does when it's working well. The problem with the injections is you, you start down here at a low level, you give an injection, you go way up, you feel like Superman, and then a week later it comes back down. And that's not how your body works. So that's an issue. We also see um, a problem with w when there's too many red blood cells made, um, which can ca cause stroke or heart attack potentially, you see it with injections, not the other sources. The other issue is you got to come in and see your doctor every two weeks, and there's some time and expense with that. So. Um, this is an option, but it's, it's probably not our first line option. Patches. This is the medicine that, that started this. Um, it's not on the market anymore. Um, there's a big problem with adherence to the scrotum and irritation. Um, there are uh, non-scrotal patches available. I, I don't think I have any patients, maybe one on, on these currently. Um, they cause a lot of irritation, poor adhesion, um, but they are physiologic. They give you that nice steady state. These are the products. Um, there are four of them that we currently use, and they're basically a, a, a skin cream or a gel, and you incorporate it into your kind of daily grooming regimen every day. And it's simple. You don't have to see a doctor um, very often to do this. Um, there's no irritation. Um, it's pretty effective. I quote patients an 85% success rate in terms of these being absorbed properly. The issue with these is transference. So they take two to three hours to completely dry. And during that time, if, if your skin touches your wife, your spouse, your kids, your grandkids, they're going to pick up some testosterone, and you obviously don't want that. So that's the main issue with these. Pellets. So this is a yearly thing we can do where you come into the office, we numb up an area of your, your backside and make a little incision and put a certain amount of pellets, depending on your testosterone, under the skin and put a little stitch, and, and that's it. And they, they, they give off testosterone for half a year to a year. So it's easy because it's a once a year thing. The main issue I have with these in my practice is insurance. Insurance companies don't like to pay for these things. And if, if they're not going to pay, then, then you're stuck with a pretty decent sized bill. So we have to be pretty careful on who's cleared for these. So take home. Um, it's a common issue. Um, there are pretty significant um, effects for guys who suffer from this. Um, assessment is straightforward, treatment is straightforward. The risks are acceptable. We have to be very care careful with the cardiovascular risks. Those are going to be better worked out in the future. Um, questions? No, we're not. We're, we're looking at red blood cells in terms of monitoring treatment response, but it's just the level of the, the hormone in your blood. It's, it's, it, it exists in three, it exists by itself bound to albumin, which is a protein, and then bound to SHBG, which is sex hormone binding globulin. And so they look at a ratio of those, and that determines what, what your level is. But to answer it simply, it's a, it's a blood test. Sure, again, you know, if, if it, it's all, it, it, for me, it's not so much the number, if you meet the minimum, it's what your symptoms are. So if your number's 300 and you feel great, and your, your bone density is fine and you're not having effects, that's, that's okay and you can leave that alone. I have, I have patients with really significant effects who their, their testosterone is 280. So not that much of a quantitative difference, but they, they really feel that difference. So yeah, it's, it's, you, have to, you have to talk with people on an individual basis. All right, thank you.